Hello. How you doing, Esty? Good. How are good, you? Good, good. My name is Dwayne, and the name of my podcast is Life and Games People Play. And today we have a special guest, a very special guest with us, Esty. And she represents and on the website Forever in My Heart. Forever with a capital N my heart. And Esther today is going to bring, came, volunteer her time to talk about the RETS diagnosis, uh, symptoms, and not only the symptoms, but how to get through it if you have a family member or someone that's been diagnosed with RET, because she's been through it all. And thank you for coming, and thank you for being willing to share your time and your personal information with us. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Esty. Uh, uh, who, where you from? Your name and all that. Tell us, especially your name. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Estee. Um, my mom named me after her favorite perfume. Um, and I am from North Carolina. Um, and I love art and I have lots of little hobbies um, of drawing and painting and I love um, hiking and um, singing and writing poetry. So, yep. I'm just doing different things, living life, in other words. So now what we want to talk about is that how you maintain and, and keep a good spirit and keep wanting to have those hobbies and, 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 and getting through um, challenges like you have. And you have a son that had Rhett, and he's no longer with us. So right. Explain that to us. How do you get through that? How did you get through it? Um, well, uh, obviously there's prayer, um, but I um, I use a combination of um, art and uh, journaling. Um, it's very good for you to be able to get your emotions down on paper or uh, out um, and because if you keep them in, um, they can uh, give you lots of anxiety and um, your thoughts are what really uh, pretty much control your your life really if, if you really get down to it and so the when you're thinking negative things you can you're gonna feel negative things and then if you if you're doing that all the time your body isn't going to be very healthy mm -hmm. so very good to sleep. Tell us a, a little bit, if you would, about your son. And explain, so, explain why you do this. Can you explain rat disease and rat diagnosis? Sure. Absolutely. Um, Jacob, um, he was born uh, normally, and he, um, however, about six months old of age, he. Um, wasn't able to hold up his head. I had to hold up his head. And, um, cause he was kind of like a floppy noodle. And so, uh, after some time with lots of therapy, it, that started getting a little bit better. Um, and we started taking him to a genetic doctor and, um, they did all kinds of, um, blood work on him and on my family. And it took a long time to get a diagnosis. And the reason for that is because Rett syndrome, R-E-T-T -T syndrome, um, is a, uh, usually it's a mutation that is found um, on the X chromosome. Mm -hmm. So um, don't quote me because sometimes I forget all the details, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> that the female has two X's and um, a Y, whereas the males have one Y and one X. And so um, the mutation is found almost on the end of the spectrum. And um, it's 
there's only one in 10,000 girls that have Rett syndrome and it's one in a million for the boys. Um, and so back in the day, you know, they, they weren't really wanting to diagnose the males with Rett syndrome because for the most part, they were thinking it was only for girls. Um, and that was part of the reason why they didn't, uh, why they wanted to rule it out at first. And so it took until he was probably 10 years old for him to get the diagnosis. Um, and about that time he, before he had been eating and chewing and swallowing. Okay. But at that point, because it's a neurological disorder, um, it affects everything from uh, speech um, movements with your your um, your arms, your legs, everything. It, it affects everything, and so because of that, he was um, aspirating on his food and um, and also not gaining much weight, much less having some other issues uh, with his digestion. Yeah. Um, and Impossible so, to gain weight almost. Yeah, because first, you know, you're, you know, you, you're going to have all kinds of digestive is issues because if you think about it, we, when we are standing, when you stand, it helps with your digestion um, or, or sitting children that are, are like my son, it's very difficult for them to sit. Um, usually they are either bed bound or they have to be in a wheelchair and being in the wheelchair, it's hard to get the right positioning. And so he, at that point, got a feeding tube. And, um, so then he, he started gaining some weight, not an awful lot. He was always a skinny, tall, little, uh, handsome boy. And, um, it was very difficult though. I wasn't just his mom. I was his caretaker. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was, I, I was doing, I was wearing all kinds of hats. I was like a nurse. So I was, um, taking his meds and I was crushing them and I was mixing them with water and I was measuring them out and putting them in through his feeding tube. Mm -hmm. Most people give their, you know, their medicine to their children by mouth or, or something like that. But this is through a feeding tube. And then after that, I had to flush it, make sure there wasn't in, any infection. Um, and so it was, it was, it was a, it was a very um, difficult responsibility, but also a blessing. Um, and we ended up being in the ER a lot um, because he was also nonverbal, which I, I didn't mention because there's so much involved in the whole picture that um well he was nonverbal, so when when he was in a lot of pain i didn't know why mm. and the doctors don't know very much about red syndrome and so first of all if you suspect that your child has red syndrome um they have to go and get blood work done and um there's a lot of characteristics that it has that that kind of closely represents some other um, syndromes. Uh, at first they thought, okay, well, he has Prater Willie syndrome because he would not stop eating. Like he, he never got that signal of, okay, I'm content. Mm -hmm. um, and so they thought he had Prater Willie syndrome. They thought, and two, a lot of the time the doctors, when they don't have a diagnosis, they just put it in a cauldron and they name it, um, Hold on, I know what this is called. Um, CP, which stands for um, cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. and um, and so you know, at first they were they were wanting to just you know put that label on, but after some time, they finally came up with that di that diagnosis, and. He, Eventually, how did how did how did he how did he finally he told me about this how he deteriorated? Tell us about that. Right. So, so when he um, 
When he got to be 13 years old, I no longer could carry him by myself. He was very tall and he was very heavy and it was a two man job. You could not, one person could not pick him up and put him in the wheelchair mm. from his bed to his wheelchair or vice versa. It had to be two people. Um, for one reason that also he was also what they considered medically fragile. Um, and what that means is that no, his bones wouldn't shatter, um, but they they could break if you're mm -hmm. not careful. And so it takes two to, to carry him and put him in position. And so after a while, I had to find a, um, a facility to, to take care of him because I, like I said, I couldn't take care of him on my own anymore. And um, so that was very difficult. Um, one, being able to trust that someone else is going to be able to take care of your child. Mm -hmm. um, and since we found the, this facility, it was um, a five hour drive from where we were living. And so uh, we had to make the decision that we would eventually move um, actually up here because we moved we moved here to North Carolina from South Carolina. South Carolina, I, I do not know why, but they do not have any facilities in South Carolina where, and this is the point, Jacob is not or was not um, a child that you could re rehabilitate. So a lot of these centers or facilities are there to help children rehabilitate like lots of therapy and so on and and after some time maybe they'll be able to walk or whatever children but like it gets yeah, worse it, yeah, yeah. It, well because what happens is with Rett syndrome you most of them if not all of them have at some point what is called a um a digression okay so children at a certain age they start to to have these uh, milestones okay and they would reach this milestone and then sometime later they might lose that milestone so as an example and this is this is an extreme example that I found um, there was a girl who one day was um, walking around and all of a sudden she just fell down for no reason she couldn't get up and she was crying and she just no longer could even talk anymore so not only did she fall down, couldn't understand why she fell down and couldn't get back up and walk, but she couldn't tell her mommy what was going on with her. And that that's an extreme, that's like an extreme example, but that's what happens. They have a digression where they lose those skills. So for Jacob, he lost the skill of eating. Like I said, you know, at, at the age of like 10 years old at the age of 13 when after we had moved him into this facility which at first i was thinking that had something to do with it but it wasn't um at 13 his dystonia um dystonia is a signal that you get within the brain where your your extremities start pulling backwards your arm either goes like this or or their legs get crossed like that um, and they get stuck that way for Jacob, his head was being pulled backwards and he was literally in a U shape where his head was almost touching his butt and he is actually stuck that way. And because of that, um, his, his organs were not um, working properly. He ended up getting a, a GI bleed um, and then uh, he aspirated on what he threw up which is actually blood and then he um he aspirated on that that turned into pneumonia and then when they went in to take an x-ray uh which was not the most uh easiest x-ray much less the least comfortable because they were practically hanging him upside down it was very it was it was very traumatic but anyway mm -hmm. so once they took that x-ray they found out that his right lung um was significantly smaller than the left and one of the times because we were in and out of the hospital like it's so when it started getting really bad in may of 2019 
we went in the hospital for a couple months and he had gotten pneumonia and his right lung actually had collapsed at that time. Mm. And they, they finally got that back up and he was, you know, he's breathing. And, um, and then a couple months later, so May, June, July, we're okay. And then August came along and then he threw up blood and then August, September, October, November. Yeah. So then, so from August all the way up to like, I'd say, let's see, August, September, October. Right. And then there was like maybe a month or less than a month that there was like a little bit of a break mm. where he, he was, he seemed to be doing okay because he finally got his blood count back up mm-hmm. and then it happened again where he had his GI bleed. And so he, he actually um, pa- passed away or died from um, a GI bleed. He wasn't um, because there was blood in his, his feeding tube. He was mm-hmm. not able to. Mm-hmm. And then he started absorbing his CO2. Okay. So, so tell me, how do you, how did you, how do you process that today? Because I know going through things, we don't usually have time to grieve. But once you get through, I know, and you say you journal. So how do you do, how do you do, how do you cope with your pain and your stress? Because you seem to do a lot of diagnosis, self-diagnosis. So I, I see you have the little books you journal. You have some creative processes that you use. Show us that. Um, so this is just an example. Um, this is this isn't really much of one. I'll I actually the one that I did most of my um bigger art was in a different one, but this is this is a Coptic stitched uh handmade journal. Um the this is a copper plate right there. Um and so this is just an example. Um, it's different kinds of art um, that I put in here, but this is this is the one that really says a lot. This one says, talking about my son, he was the center, and now things are like the dots, which mm-hmm. are all around the center, um, a mess. Now I must find my way back to the center. And so this right here um, is is an uh, actually a napkin that was painted. And what that is, is you're taking this and you're, you're, you're covering over. And, and essentially what that is, is like, so you're, you're dealing with these negative emotions and you write it down. And if you were to look at that, that, that negative feeling all the time, you're just going to keep this cycle of negativity. So you can either put like a napkin over it, or you can take like some white paint. Um, it's called, I should know this because artists use it all the time. I want to say gosh. Oh, anyway. <laughs> so what you do is you take white acrylic paint and mm-hmm. you paint over that, and then you can put some beautiful art on top of that. And so what that does is it's kind of like a healing process. You're taking the negativity, you're taking it out of yourself, you're putting it down on paper, and then and then covering that over with something positive so that you're not going back and looking at that negative feeling. Because if you go back and you're looking at that negative feeling, I mean, years later, that's one thing. But if you if you go back and look at it like tomorrow, that's not going to really help you to look at that negative feeling and be able to just be stuck in this box of negativity. And so that's, that's one way of doing it. Um, writing, writing it down a lot of, a lot of the time, a lot of people don't know where to start. Um, I can help with that. Uh, essentially the most important thing is to understand what those feelings are. Okay. Um, and so let me show you real quick. So if I don't drop it. Okay. So this, this simply you can get at, um, like I got this off of Etsy. 
for like $4. Mm -hmm. Okay. What it is, is it's an emotional color wheel. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so as an example, um, let's say you're feeling sad. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's more to just sad. Okay. Sad is a, com a component of other feelings. So as an example, um, sad, maybe you were hurt, um, disappointed, um, hopeless, depressed. Uh, I cannot say this, I cannot pronounce this right. So don't judge me. Barna okay. I'm just skip that one. Okay. <laughs> Spell, spell it for us. Okay. Spell it for us. Okay. B U L N E R A B L E. Okay. Burn. Yeah. Um, it's not vulnerable, is it? Yes. <laughs> okay. I, I, I do not know why I cannot say that. Okay. Okay. Um, Maybe because you don't want to be. Huh? Maybe because you don't want to be vulnerable. Yeah, no, thank you. I've yeah. been there on that and I got the t shirt and bleached it and wore it again. Mm -hmm. All right. Um and then pressured burnout. Show show us what you're looking at. Yeah, so burnout, lonely, depressed, all of those, all the blue. Okay. All the blue is sadness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um fear is purple. Red is anger, which is that that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. you're red in the face when you're mad. Um, orange is power, so it's uh -huh. not all negative. Um, yellow is joy, uh -huh. and then green is disgust. Okay, okay. which okay. I mean, if you guys saw that that movie, what was that movie? The feeling movie. Mm -hmm. Anyway, oh, Inside <laughs> Out. Yes. You, saw, you saw Inside Out. Mm -hmm. No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay. So, um, so being able to know what those feelings are, that's what you want to do first. You want to understand what those feelings are because you can feel different feelings all at once. Sometimes you're, maybe you're, um, you're sad, but you're also scared. Mm -hmm. because maybe you're scared that something's going to happen and you're sad because of it. Or um, maybe you're, um, mad, but you're also like, sometimes like, it's so crazy. Sometimes I'll, I'll feel like I'm like, I'm tired, but I'm also really wired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you're able to like figure out what those feelings are, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. then you write it down, you write down that feeling. And then what you do is kind of like dis dissecting your feelings so then after you, you write down what that feeling is, then you, then you write down why, why are you feeling that? If you don't know why you're feeling that, um, then you may need a little bit of assistance. Sometimes that takes, um, maybe seeing a therapist, um, or just thinking about what maybe caused you to feel that way. Okay. So as an example, sometimes maybe you're going through something that's traumatic and you end up, if, especially if you have PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress syndrome, then sometimes you can have something that triggers a memory. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a song, maybe it's a loud noise. And then if you're sitting there and you write down what's going on, you know, like what you're feeling, then you think, okay, what is it that made me feel this way? You know, um, and for the most part, you usually can come up with that. You can usually figure out what that is. So yeah, well, you have a lot of creations that you're gonna share with people in the future. Like yeah. your, um, I saw that little book you had last week, but I know you're gonna have to take time to put them together, probably in yeah. your next video. Yeah. So um, I appreciate everything you do share with us because there's a lot of people that really don't know how uh, or how they feel or why they feel like they do yeah. but you've conquered a lot and I really look forward to your next series the next video when you explain more and show us more in detail yes you absolutely. will journal how you do journal how you get through it but I've been enlightened and I know everybody else has 
and thank you for taking the time out to share. And I know this is our second time doing this, and 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 there's a lot of information that's left out. But oh, excuse me, we'll do it the next time. Okay. All right. Enjoy meeting your little daughter too. Maybe she'll be on a podcast with you next time. Maybe we'll see. Yeah. Sometimes her energy is a bit much. Mm-hmm. All right, and um, share with us you know, how to, how to contact you because I know okay. a lot of people want to talk to you. Sure. Um, the, I have a Google uh, phone number. It's nine one nine six three five. 0581. Okay. You need me to say it again? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I have a Google business phone number. It's 919 635 0581. Okay, and then I also have a Facebook page, uh, the same business name, which is Forever in My Heart LLC. Uh, and I have a TikTok, which is the same, but that one is the letter for instead mm-hmm. of F-O-R. Um, and I also am on Instagram and that one is, uh, four and then under underscore ever underscore in underscore my underscore part. Uh, no. mm. yeah, Uh-oh. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. So, um, yeah, that's how you can you can um, contact me. I also have email. So um, we'll just link all that info down below. All right. And um, if you like this awesome, wonderful podcast that we have, uh, do consider giving us a thumbs up. Subscribe because you're not going to want to miss our wonderful videos and also um, push that bell icon because that will give you a notification as to when we go and do another one all right thank you so much thank you for being so powerful and thank you for being you thank you all right oh my pleasure and honor i love being educated All right. You stay powerful and talk to you the next time. Okay. Bye-bye.